Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And that is, with Almighty God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. I want to greet you all, our listening audience, our viewing audience, uh, with that greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. And also, we want to extend the greetings of this blessed month of Ramadan as we say, Ramadan Mubarak. So welcome to another session uh, hosted by Masjid Muhammad, the nation's mosque. Uh, we welcome you to this session today. We're going to be speaking and having a discussion on Ramadan, the Quranic leadership of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad. And I am, if you don't know me, those who don't know me, I'm uh, Imam Talib Sharif of, of Masjid Muhammad and Nation's Mosque. Uh, this community goes back about 80, almost 83, four years now, uh, starting with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, transitioned by his son, which is our subject matter today, Imam Waratuddin Muhammad. Uh, this mosque that we're leading now in Washington, D.C. is the oldest Muslim community uh, in Washington, D.C. And the mosque that's been built in Washington, D.C. is the first mosque built. So hear me out now. I'm not <laughs> used to the first mosque built in America, uh, but it is the first mosque built in America by descendants of enslaved Africans. And it ended up being 100 percent American. Uh, the ones that were built before that one were built by migrants. Uh, in Cedar Rapids and then also in the Dakotas. Uh, so uh, this is a very historical uh, masjid, uh, also called mosque uh, here in the nation's capital of America City, uh, the nation's mosque, which is one of the reasons why it's called uh, the nation's mosque. This is one of the reasons, uh, not the only reason. Uh, so we're gonna be speaking about Imam Wartha D. Muhammad. I'm a product of Imam Wartha D. Muhammad. I'm a second generation Muslim connected to that history I just told you about. Uh, Imam Muhammad Muhammad inspired me to actually go into the military. I ended up spending 30 years in the military. And you're going to hear reasons why and his thinking from a lot of our, our, our comments from our speakers today, our panelists. Uh, and I spent 30 years uh, based on, on what he did. In fact, uh, one of our authors here uh, on the front of his book, uh, he has Imam Muhammad Muhammad holding up the American flag. And that's part of what the incident that inspired me uh, with his comments that went along with that. Uh, uh, at, at going to go into the military and serve. And I know some people, they see that to be something wrong. Uh, some would even say that is is prohibited. Uh, uh, some would call it deviations, you know, but again, uh, this is some antiquated thinking, uh, erroneous thinking, some, some misguided thinking. And we're gonna hear uh, from some of our scholars today uh, here in America and in both of these individuals, uh, neither one of them are first generation. They're products of the first generation. And so it's a blessing and it's also should be an encouragement uh, for those who are gonna be listening to this uh, particular uh, discussion here uh, to hear from these, the, these children of the first generation products and what they've been able to accomplish uh, in the kind of work that they're doing uh, right now today. So I'm joined uh, by uh, Imam, also chaplain, Salahuddin Muhammad. And I'm gonna give you a little bit about him. Uh, he, he currently serves as a clinical chaplain for the Buell of Prisons. Uh, he is a member of the Association of Muslim Chaplains and he serves as associate imam at uh, uh, Salam Islamic Center in Raleigh, North Carolina. Imam Salahuddin, he had a master's degree in Islamic studies and Christian Muslim relations and he's received that from uh, Hartford Seminary in Hartford, Connecticut. As a student of the late Imam Warathad D. Muhammad, and we say Rahim Allah Lehi, uh, he authored the book, it's called America's Imam, Warathad D. Muhammad's Interpretation of Islam in the, in, the, in the Middle of American Society. The book introduces Imam Muhammad's comprehensive understanding and application of Islam in the context of the American society. Now, uh, dear Imam uh, Salahuddin, he comes from, again, a rich religious uh, tradition on both sides of his family. And uh, he is, he just happens to be a third generation Muslim American, again, dating back to that history under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was succeeded by his son, Imam Warathad Muhammad, who is again the subject of this discussion today. I would also want to add that uh, Imam Salahuddin, he is married, with three children, uh, two girls, and one boy. Uh, the topic today 
it was Ramadan, Ramadan. And we know Ramadan, uh, this is the month in which the Quran was revealed. So the topic is Ramadan, the Quranic leadership, the Quranic leadership of the man worth of D. Muhammad. And both of our authors are going to speak to how that has influenced uh, their thinking and their product as well. We're going to start with uh, dear Imam Salahuddin, and then I'll come back after him and, and uh, introduce our beloved brother as well, uh, Dr. Muhammad Frazier Rahim. So, uh, Salahuddin, Imam, we want you to please speak to the, to the uh, audience today, first of all, uh, about your book. What is, what is your book deal with? I just gave just a one-liner, so get into it a little more about your book. Yeah, so uh, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Salatu Wa Salam, Ala Rasulullah. So I want to um, just uh, first and foremost uh, tell uh, Master Muhammad, uh, thank you for having this um, forum and this panel because it's needed. Uh, we're in a time where uh, Quranic leadership is needed to be in the foremost or be in the front. So I want to first and foremost um, say thank you. Um, but so, so, so basically my book, um, it was first my uh, thesis that I wrote um, for my thesis to get my master's degree. And you know, when you write a thesis, you have to defend it. Um, so when I defended my thesis, I was surprised um, that they told me that I had the best thesis that year. So in my mind, I was like, well, I have to turn this into a book. So I um, decided to do that. And, and then the second reason um, why I put together this book is because I'm a um, student of Imam Muhammad. And I remember him saying to us, he said, give me a good future. So for me, giving him a good future uh, meant uh, to take this, to take this bold effort, and to try to codify his body of knowledge, and so what I did, I published a book, and so this book, hopefully, inshallah, capsulizes his contributions and service that he made to the Quran and the message of Al Islam for over 33 years, okay? And then also this, this book, um, it was done to also help us to identify many important methodological principles utilized by Imam Muhammad in reaching his main audience that was the American mind or the American society. <clears throat> And so I also demonstrate how he implemented an often overlooked method of, of clarifying and interpreting the message of the Quran by referring to the Bible or the Christian Bible. And then also in my book, I also introduce how he brought new and unnoticed meanings and insights to human life and to human beings' perceptions of themselves and their realities. And then lastly, what I show is how he was able to show Muslims how to be Muslim and be an American citizen by getting into the fabric of this society and embracing the best that America has to offer. And this was all done by him having what I say in my book, a scriptural rooted rhetoric. So he was, he was guided by the Quran, no doubt. He was guided by the Quran. And I remember there was a, um, um, interview that Imam Bernard Fareed, may Allah have mercy on him and grant him paradise. He asked Imam Muhammad this um, question. I'm going to read this question that he asked him. He said, 
what has the Quran done for you? And, it, and then immediately, Imam Muhammad, he said, it has completed my um, humanity, my identity, my life. My life is the love of Allah, the Quran and Prophet Muhammad. The Quran completes my life, completes my form. And then he says, and he says, before that, my identity was incomplete. But God, through the Quran, completed my humanity, completed my identity, completed my life. So he was submerged by the Quran. And when you look at the some of the hadiths from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he speaks about those who are the Sahabil Quran, those who are the companions of the Quran. And Imam Muhammad, that's what he was. He was a companion of the Quran. He was guided by the Quran. He was directed by the Quran. And he wanted his, um, those who, who were part of his community, he wanted us to be people of the Quran. So his leadership was guided by the um, Quran. And through my book, I show you, I show, show the reader that everything he did has his proofs in the Quran. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, so you, you're certainly hitting on, the, on this theme uh, because just again, being the month of Ramadan and the Quran being the most important thing, uh, we, we, we want to look at how did Imam Muhammad get now? We, now we have something happening that hadn't taken place in America's history. When we look at it in the past, where so many have begun to be attracted to the Quran. And I know both of you have studied the foundation of this movement to see that Imam Wartha D. Muhammad had a lot of help. He had a lot of help uh, from his father and had a lot of help from uh, W.D. Farad, who also initiated the movement his father became the leader of. Uh, we know there's a famous picture of his father, him, uh, and Farad, and Imam Muhammad has the Quran. And in fact, his father gave him the Quran uh, to make sure he would hold the Quran. And I want to let those uh, know who are listening now, if you don't know, again, I, I, was, I was very small uh, when I was introduced to what was called the Nation of Islam. And I, my uncle was the first. He's the one that brought me in uh, later. I remember going to his home in 1971. 71 or 72 and I saw this book I have never seen this before this book was on on top of he had a um, China cabinet it was the tallest thing and it had a China cabinet had the top this book was sitting up I did, actually I didn't know what it was it was something wrapped up in a towel and I wanted to know I wouldn't I wouldn't I, I wouldn't uh, used to see anything like that so I asked him I said what is that and I, I recall him now again now this was a book uh that he wasn't really reading because they weren't they didn't they weren't taught to read it, but they were taught something else valuable about it to get them ready for Imam Wafa D. Muhammad. So he took, the, he took and pulled it down and unwrapped it. It was a white towel on it. He unwrapped it. He was looking at me smiling. I guess he was glad I asked him that question because he wanted to say something to me or share it with me. He unwrapped it. And then he, he, he kissed it. Now, this is, again, the 70s. He don't, he had, the transition hadn't taken place. He kissed it. And then he, he, he but, but I, I want to say, before he even took it down, he, he said, let me go wash my hands. He went and washed his hands first, made sure he was clean. And then he grabbed it, took it down, unwrapped it, and began to read uh, to me. And then he introduced me, told me what it was. And he said, he said, this should be, he said, nothing in your home, no book in your home, nothing should be higher than this book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, of course, I remember, I remember that. I remember that. So I'm, that's, one of the, that's one of the things in terms of the help uh, that Imam Wafa D. Muhammad had received, again, one who was born into that movement and the Quran being so high and his father telling him, I heard him tell his, his father, say his father told him that if he stayed with the Quran, he would never go wrong. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, Ramadan, the Quran and leadership. Now I want to go to, I want to, I got some questions. So I'm going to come back, but I want to go ahead and give, give you Imam, uh, uh, pardon me, Dr. Muhammad Frazier Rahim. Uh, let me, for those who don't know him, 
Uh, he's the executive director uh, for North America, of, of North America for Killiam International. He's an expert on violent extremism issues globally, and he's a scholar on Africa. Prior to his current role, he served as a senior program officer at the United States Institute of Peace, where he led their Horn of Africa program. His areas of specialty are on transnational terrorist movements, Islamic intellectual history, uh, Muslim communities in the West and Africa affairs. And I want to also say that in addition, uh, he worked for the United States government for more than a decade uh, for the Department of Homeland Security, uh, for the Director of National Intelligence, and for the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, when he was there, he used to provide strategic advice and executive branch analytical support on violent extremism issues to the White House and the National Security Council, where he was the author and also co-author of Presidential Daily Briefs and Strategic Assessments on ex Extremist Ideology. Now, he also conducted research in more than 40 countries on the African continent, and he worked and studied throughout the Middle East. He completed advanced Arabic language certificates at various higher uh, institutes of learning in the United States, West Africa, and the Middle East, and he earned his PhD from Howard University in African studies with a focus on Islamic thought and on violent extremism issues. And Dr. Frazier, he provided one of the first doctoral dissertations on the intellectual thought of African-American Muslims and its nexus to the broader Islamic world using original primary sources in both Arabic and English. And he focused on the American Muslim thinker, this is our subject for this evening, Imam Walter D. Muhammad, and it was titled, this is what it was titled, The Making of American Islam and the Emergence of Western Islamic Intellectual Thought to Counter Violent Extremism a case study of American Muslim revivalist, Imam W. Dean Muhammad. And we know that this particular dissertation was the basis of his book that's now um, America's Other Muslims, Imam W. D. Muhammad, Islamic Reform and the Making of American Islam. And our dear doctor, our professor, he's also a second generation Muslim American, dating back to the leadership of, Imam Walter, of, of Elijah Muhammad, and who was succeeded, succeeded by his son, Imam Walter D. Muhammad, our subject for today. So I will ask you the same question, uh, Dr. Frazier. What, introduce us to your book. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> uh, it's an honor. First, I want to thank Master Muhammad, uh, where Washington, D.C. has been my home for over 15 years, and uh, <clears throat> coming from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, in which uh, I was raised in a beautiful community. Um, I want to start off to say, and I, and I caveat that and, and frame it in that, that context because um, on my mother's side, they're Gullah Geechee, and my father's from New York. And as we know collectively, the enslaved African Muslim tradition has a wealth of Islamic roots um, and a further study that will be coming up down the line We'll be looking at how we re-examine and reinterpret Gullah Geechee traditions, not just being a framing from a uh, sort of a Christian framing, but also multiple religious traditions, including Islam as well. Um, I, this all developed from coming out of the community, raised, going to Quranic school, I call it, you know, in, in classical Islamic traditions, there's a lot of terms that are used, but we have our own framing of how we use them. And I think that that's important because, uh, you know, one might call it a madrasa, but our madrasa equivalent was Claire Muhammad School, which was uh, this national network, including the Caribbean, that helped raise and groom individuals like myself and our brother, Imam Chaplain Salahuddin Muhammad. And so I, I think that our work can't just be seen in this sort of scholarly, academic, ivory tower framing, but how are we applying it in a lived Islamic experience? And I think that is, that's really part of the framework of what we know the late Imam Warfi Muhammad uh, brought about. Um, I wanna start also to give credit to the late Dr. Suleiman Yang, who was 
uh, my professor and the reason why I went to Howard University. I got into many other universities to finish do my PhD, but Howard was the focus and particularly with our, our teacher, Dr. Suleiman Yang, who was a meticulous uh, preserver and documenter of the legacy of Imam Muhammad and a great bridge builder. In this Ramadan, I would be, I, I would be, uh, I would be, uh, I wouldn't do full justice if I did not conjure the words of our late Dr. Suleiman Yang, who said that the shaitan lives by three things, ignorance, arrogance, and deception. And that ignorance, arrogance, and deception is one in which we seek to lock up in these first 10 days of Ramadan, making sure that we develop the mental, the intellectual, and spiritual fortitude to thrive so that the rest of our year is one of, of, of a heavenly abode. This came about in this book, particularly America's Other Muslims right here, um, really starting from my undergraduate time working on as a working and did my uh, undergraduate degree in, in, in history. And it was a focus on enslaved African Muslims in, in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia. And then my master's work, which was in history as well at Howard University, where I was focusing on uh, building off that enslaved uh, Muslim legacy, but also how do I connect this to a broader story of the Africana experience? Where is the African diaspora, including us who live in America, and how is it connected to our rich tradition back in West Africa as well? And, and I think that for me, then deciding to then go to get my PhD at Howard with Dr. Yang, it was how do I fuse all this work that I have been doing my whole career, certainly working in the policy space, working in government, addressing individuals who unfortunately taste it, take a twisted, narrow interpretation of Islam, and how do I bring life to all this? I remember my father used to tell me, I, I, as a student, I studied in West Africa, Senegal, God, <laughs> Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. And I remember my father constantly telling me, when I went to West Africa, he said, when you go there, extract the knowledge, but, the, but, but do not become someone else. And I think that that's a very important context that I did not know at that time as a young 21, 22 year old, or, or 19, excuse me, I was younger than that, when I was then going to use that information, that experience that would then give rise to this book. And, it, and so I think the book really breaks down this rich legacy of Islamic tradition rooting in the West African experience. Certainly, as we know very clearly that there are more Muslims in Ethiopia than there are in Oman. There are more Muslims in Nigeria than there are in Qatar. We have a rich tradition of Islamic scholarship and learning and inquiry and individuals, uh, particularly in West African thought, brought in enrichment and enhancement. And so I, I was, as a student, fascinated, mastered the traditions of, as we should as, as, as our late Imam Muhammad in, instructed us. He says, understand the rise and fall of Islamic civilization, understand your place, your history, in the United States and then also offer some contribution. And certainly there's much more that he built off on that. But I think that that point right there was, to me, as a young person raised in this community, it was an instruction also to master the basics. So understand the classical Islamic tradition, but also how do you offer an enrichment, just like our West African brothers, our, our West African ancestral roots brought an enrichment on the Arabic language when they had Ajami and offered Hausa Ajami or Wolof Ajami or Swahili Ajami, which brought additional vowel marks to that, to their language. So Arabic has three and these other traditions had way more than three vowel marks offering local language using the Arabic script. So what for me that it was the point of the, the, the point of uh, or the final destination wasn't just in West Africa. How can I connect this story of Islamic reform or revivalism or renewal, however the term you want to use? I mean, essentially, it was this idea of how do you frame that context of all this rich legacy and learning that we had, that, that, that Imam Muhammad was, uh, was, was, was offering? How do I connect it and using some of the classical traditions and finding a way to connect the two? And, I, and, I, and, and so what I did is made a book, could have been about 500 pages, but it's a very nice, tight, 
uh, I think 150 pages that I think is resourceful for the, for the academician, for the lay person, for the religious person, for the student in which they can then see the evolution of Islam in Africa and its journey into the new world, including Islamic hybrid movements. And then what we know is what I characterize as a, 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 a movement that really cultivated a, a change in the US context, but also internationally speaking, which has much more work to do as well. And so the, the, the book itself highlights this evolution, Islamic thought, Islamic reform, and dare should I say, an American uh, school of Islamic thinking or a Western school of Islamic thinking, you know, the, the, this is important to offer because now American Muslims, Western Muslims are addressing that there is a time space context in which we are having to respond to our condition. Imam, Maham, Imam uh, Sharif knows very often, and I like how you opened up, people have questioned this idea of American Islam. What does this mean? Is this some sort of uh, uh, step down form of Islam? And I think that really, you know, the, the prophetic tradition that says, what, love of country is part of faith. That this idea of loving where you are. Allah put us on this planet Earth, and Allah put us specifically in the United States. And so what I would, would, would just wrap up so we can allow more time is that this book charts that evolution. And then I also characterize Imam Muhammad as this intellectual thinker. I, 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 I call him the, uh, the, the 21st century Islamic intellectual. Because I think what Imam Muhammad also was very much a, um, a lay person who is practical for everyone, but he also offered similar deep philosophical, spiritual understanding, like other great Islamic thinkers that have been in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Africa, in Asia. And to me, that offers an equal contribution that we, that Imam Muhammad and the community might have offered different language terminologies. For example, many in the Muslim world would say that individuals receive an ijazah, they received a certificate of learning on a particular science of Islamic thought. But maybe in our community, that wasn't language that was used. So, we, so, so I think it's an interesting uh, idea of what comes about next. And um, so I highlight Imam Muhammad's intellectual thinking. And then I also offer, I think, which is really important, is this idea of this community that has a network of over 300 plus masjids, uh, masjids throughout the United States, has been able to be integrated members of the broader society and has by default, not even purposely, offers a antidote, if you will, in this time of COVID, um, against extremism. But it was a natural expression of, this isn't what the community is going out to do to say, hey, we're standing against violent extremism. No, as Imam Muhammad highlighted, the community itself was rooted in a Quranically based thinking. And so as Imam Muhammad offered on numerous occasions, he says, the one who created you shall guide you that this Quranic based framing of the universe, that the creation itself is the womb of knowledge, as Imam Muhammad also offered, but that the creation itself is also engaged in a form of cosmic witnessing as well. And I think that this is really exciting to see how this community has evolved and will continue to evolve and it, is, uh, it has been a quiet community that I think now is in a posture of reasserting itself and offering and in, in, in trying to find where the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years will be. Because the best and final thing, and I'll leave you with this, this part, is that Imam Muhammad said on various settings, including in Ramadan sessions, that is that the best to come is not the generations who were sitting and were uh, compiling and writing down his Ramadan session notes. But we will get this thing right, as he said, and maybe not my children's generation, but the generation that will come next. And it will not look like how we saw it to be the decades prior, that they will offer something that is radically uh, innovative and creative and that builds off of the rich tradition of the Islamic uh, uh, way 
of, of contribution of the past, not to be stuck in a fossilized interpretation of the past, but seeing the future as something bright, uh, the seeing the, the, something for the future as, uh, as, as hopeful and inspirational as well. Thank you. Greatly appreciate that, uh, uh, Dr. Frazier Rahim. Now, I, I have a couple of questions. And in fact, this, this first one really is, is going to come to both of you, but, I, but uh, this is how it comes. Uh, uh, Imam Salahuddin, uh, one of the questions is why you choose the title America's Imam? Now, we, uh, and uh, so we, we know Imam, he didn't call himself that, but where did it come from? Why you use that particular title? And, and how does that relate to, to, to this direction of this chronic leadership? Mm, that's, that's a good question. Um, so uh, first, um, the title of America, Imam, uh, when I was searching for a title for my thesis, um, I came across the Chicago Tribune, and, and they had an article in there titled America's Imam. And I was like, man, there it is. There's, there's the um, uh, title. And so um, it wasn't something that, something that I made up. It was something that the, um, those in the public um, gave him. Uh, and so how, so how does America's Imam tie in with the Quranic leadership? And, and so when you look at my whole title, the whole title of my book, is America's Imam, Imam Wapdu Muhammad's interpretation of Islam in the milieu of America um, society. And so, um, uh, like I said in my introduction, he was guided um, by the Quran. And, and um, there's, a, there's a terminology uh, that's called uh, contextual meaning. Um, contextual meaning means that when you're able to implant your condition into a scripture and to find your condition in scripture, meaning giving it, giving it a um, context. So I met Muhammad, how he was able to lead his communities that he was always able to find a model in uh, scripture that fit our plight or our situation. And he wouldn't just do it in the um, Quran, he, saw, he will also use the Bible. And so he, he always did that. And then another thing, one of his um, strategies that he used was interfaith dialogue. In effect, dialogue. And so I, I can remember being a young man and my father, he's going out and doing interfaith dialogue. And then he had other Muslims who were criticizing him and said, why are you doing interfaith dialogue with the Christians and Jews? They are not our friends. They are they're not our friends. And, and, and so um, me looking back at that and then looking at Imam Muhammad's leadership, he was a visionary. He was he had a he had he had a Quranic mindset. And so when you look at NFA dialogue, when you look into the Quran for its proof, you can see in the Quran on this phrase what? Uh Lita Arafu. Lita Arafu. And this Lita Arafu is telling us to get to know those, learn from those, come together, join together of those who might believe different from you, who might look different from you, who might have a different um, culture from you. So Imam Muhammad, he was constantly guided by the Quran and he knew how to extract principles from the Quran. And, and as a um, student of him, sometimes he wouldn't give you the reference. He wouldn't give you the rest to the Quran. You would have to go out and search it for yourself. So, um, yeah. So that's, that's that's about it. That's about it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Imam Salahuddin mm -hmm. is another question that came up. So, so, but are you saying? Are you saying when Imam Walter D. Muhammad 
started engaging interfaith, the other Muslim communities were not doing that. Yes. Yes. So why, why, why wouldn't they? You, you, are, you are stating now. You are showing how it's rooted in Islamic doctrine to engage. Why, why wouldn't the others not engage and then say he's doing something against the Quran and the Sunnah? Well, so you have to understand that um, um, living in America and when you're dealing with Muslims, a lot of Muslims get their interpretation from um, either Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, or wherever. They get it, they get it from overseas. And so when you, when you study um, their method or you study their methodology on how to approach um, inclusion, it's not there. It's not there. So, um, so Imam Muhammad, because of the context in which he lived, he had to uh, be a mushtahad or one who, who practices ishtahad and go into the Quran and find those references that help to build his case or to help build his interpretation. And when we study Imam Muhammad, when we study his impact, we have to study him pre-9-11 and then post 9-11 to really see his impact. Because there's a lot of things he was doing pre-9-11 that he was criticized on. And then now when you look post 9-11, you see a lot of Muslim organization taking heed to the things that he was doing. Alhamdulillah. 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 You say Quranic leadership. Yes. His, Quranic, his leadership really in terms of Quranic uh, interest was out front way beyond those who, who came from Muslim lands, were born Muslim, et cetera. They didn't have that leadership that he had mm -hmm. when they accused him of not having it. But mm -hmm. he was way ahead of everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, Dr. Dr. Raheem Fraser, again, I'm getting the same question on you on your title. Okay, and, and what we're saying, you know, obviously African Americans have been here. Your title says America's Other Muslims. Mm -hmm. I wanna, why, why do you choose to say America's Other Muslims in, in light of this? You know, it's, it, I, I was sitting back and I was reflecting on the idea of, um, unfortunately, there has, uh, you know, really, the 1900s, Islam was dominated by a largely African-American narrative. Um, I mean, we, we, we look at the experience of the enslaved African Muslims and key personalities, whether it's Job bin Solomon, it's Yara Mahmoud, it's uh, uh, Omar, uh, it's uh, Omar Said, you, et cetera, or it's Islamic hybrid movements, whether they are uh, um, uh, movements like uh, the Morris Science Temple or other Sunni movements. Um, and so African-American Muslims, black Muslims in the words of C.R. Lincoln, um, have occupied the space of Islamic consciousness um, in the American fabric. And, um, and then we have a few moments that have happened. I mean, 1965, uh, we, have, we, have the, um, we have 52, we have 65, Immigration and Nationality Act. We have the Hart Sellers Act that brings massive waves of Muslim um, immigrants coming from the broader Muslim, um, from, from the Muslim world. But people forget that 1964, which is what, a key uh, watershed moment in U.S. history is also the time when um, the, the, the Civil Rights Act uh, comes about. And the Civil Rights Act in 64 is, is, key, is important because r radical changes have come about to uh, directly change America's direction and how they treat what we perceive as minorities. So in many respects, the Civil Rights Act was a direct consequence to allowing large amounts of African or large amounts of immigrant Muslims from the, what we know the known Muslim world to come into the United States. Then we have subsequent Muslim student associations. Then we have ISNA, then we have ICNA, et cetera. I only bring that context and give a go a bit down memory lane just to help us collectively uh, look at how Islam has developed. And so, you know, you have Muslim expressions, you have multiple families, you have where, where individuals are very much known to have Muslims in their family who are Christian, who are Christian family members as well. 
and then and in, in, in really we have I think the the 2000 particularly certainly as uh, uh, Chaplain and Imam um, uh, Salahuddin mentioned is that we have this moment where then 9-11 comes about and 9-11 is a bit of a, a soul-searching moment for uh, American Muslims who, uh, largely speaking, we have an African-American democratic base and then you have um, immigrant Muslims, not as a whole, because I don't like to, to, to look, do a broad brush, but you have communities who are definitely aligning with the Republican Party, et cetera. And so I just bring that context just to highlight that you have a political activism that was slowly developing. And that political activism in some shape or fashion because of resources, this suburban mosque phenomenon that prior, the urban mosque was the mosque, that the nation's mosque, Masha Muhammad, uh, and other Masha Muhammad type uh, uh, messages throughout the United States were the masjid where people went to and then splintering off. And so the America's other Muslims, unfortunately, has made many of those historical African-American Muslim communities become the other. Mm. And so that other creation has made um, what was in fact American Islam being a black Islam, if you will, uh, the Islam of hip hop, the Islam of R&B and Islam of diversity and creation and music and philosophy and artistic expression. And in some way, as many have argued and used this term, black Muslim erasure has developed. And so this America's other Muslims, in fact, has now made the ancestral, foundational, indigenous Muslim community become the other Muslims, though they have developed and cultivated the expression of what we know, Islamic roots in the United States. And so what I always, I have argued, Imam, quite often, just as much as individuals are studying Nahu, Sarf, Balaga, Islamic, Arabic, and morphology and, and, and Islamic or Arabic sciences, and they're studying fiqh, and they're studying sharia, and they're studying um, uh, memorization, and deep Islamic spiritual sci sciences, whether you're in the Sunni or Shia tradition, or if you're in a Sufi community, individuals should understand Islamic history in the United States. And that should be a required core curriculum just like someone goes to a Catholic school and learns arithmetic and logic in Catholic uh, 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 liturgy. And I think American Muslims have to understand the broader context is that the America other Muslims that have now become sort of on the, on the periphery offer, I think, a very important story that every young person who is born in the United States should know. Just as much as we study the rise of the, of the Umayyad, of the Abbasid, of the Mongo, of, of the various Muslim traditions, the Seljuks that have given us great contributions, the contributions that have developed and what we, that the historical narrative of the wilderness of North America has to be documented. For in the words of Dr. Suleiman Yang, the community must constantly move from being on the footnotes to the main text. Alhamdulillah. Mm. Another mm -hmm. question here. Uh, just questions for both of you. And we'll start with uh, 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 Imam Salahuddin. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, how do you think Imam Walter D. Muhammad would address this new trend of African-American Muslims emphasizing themselves as black Muslims in events, publications, and social media? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Um, well, he, he, um, he gave us a title. He gave us a label. <laughs> and his label that he gave us was called Bilalian. And so this whole concept of, um, of um, called Bilalian gave us a true identity, uh, separate from other um, identities that were superimposed on us. And so when you think about uh, Black Muslim, yes, it does have a history and it does have a plight. Um, but we have to understand that our leadership um, that we have as African-American 
Muslims or as um, 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 Malayans, we were formed in a way that protected us from baggage. And so he will always tell us, we are new people. We are new people. We're not the same people who we were um, doing um, um, slavery or doing Jim Crow. We are new people and, and we, are, we have been developed like a butterfly has been developed. Mm -hmm. And so now he, he would have preferred, <laughs> in my opinion, us calling ourselves um, the title of Malalian and, and, and what comes with that too. Good, that's excellent, appreciate that because you're now showing that that term black Muslims, uh, it's not, not a term that he, 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 he they, they call themselves, so to speak. Mm -hmm. His movement didn't call themselves black Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we see something happening now. So, so uh, Dr. Frazier, you want to add anything to that? Well, I would just say that, you know, the best identity, as Imam Muhammad would highlight, is the human identity. Yes. And, the, and, and, and so the, as the community has evolved, the identity of the human connections, that human connectivity, are uh, moving from small-minded thinking um, in a, um, in, in really a thinking of a parochialism, if you will. Um, and that, that evolution of Bilali and that concept was one really, I mean, we look at the historical roots of how that developed. We go back to the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Imam Muhammad was trying to uh, reorient, reorient the community into a, into a direction where many had been affected by the, the, the psychological impact of slavery, the, um, the trauma. And there's a number of studies, a fascinating study came out a couple of years ago by a Swiss researcher that talked about how trauma can move from generation to the generation through, through relationships and how that passes on. So imagine the impact of trauma it has had on um, African-American communities. And so the Bilalian identity was one to wake the consciousness of a community to be aware of their history, connecting them back to Bilal, who was the first Muezzin, who was proud of his, uh, his, his legacy coming from the African continent. Uh, now, uh, now, Imam Muhammad also wanted us to be aware of of that evolution, our historical roots, but also recognizing where we are in the contemporary context of being in America. And so the references of New Africa was connecting African roots, but also saying we are in a new society and we're a new people in, in the words of, of how he utilized on various um, uh, sessions and statements, um, both public and private. And so I think that this identity, uh, what we see this phenomenon uh, black Muslims. There's a number of online platforms that are out there. I think we have. I think there's two things we have. We have to consider. One, we have a new generation that is emerging who are looking for identity in the online space, and so the black Muslim identity is no is not just confined to what we know historically, African American Muslims who are descended of enslaved Africans. Um, and who have been a product of the peculiar institution of slavery and Jim Crow laws, et cetera. But now we have black Muslim communities who are of the diaspora, whether they're Caribbean or from African, from the African continent, who are part of what we know a broader black Muslim story. And so I think that what we what 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 are what has to continue to happen is a one, a pragmatism of engagement, recognizing that like many family, you will agree on multiple points and matters. And there's other points that there won't be a clear agreement on, 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 on efforts um, like any family. But, um, but I think that as you mentioned and captured well, is that, you know, I think Imam Muhammad certainly had an evolution of how the terminology uh, coming out. I mean, we look at Carter G. Woodson's work on miseducation of the Negro and talking about the evolution of, you know, terms and colored and Negro. And, 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 and certainly Bilalian and Black and, and African-American. So that identification is one I think of, of that has evolved. But what I would say is that um, we also have communities who are coming here in the United States who are products of the hard work of 
African American Muslim communities and that engagement with them also um, has different meanings to as well. And so I just offer that as an additional element that is part of this conversation that in some of those online spaces, that's what you, that, that, that's part of a conversation. That's not just part of the conversation of individuals who affiliate with being members of the Association of Imam Warfi Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, that's wonderful. So making sure that all the individuals will see themselves uh, in, a, in a human context uh, with elevated consciousness, uh, focus on uh, human, their human life and their ethnicity, more so than just a race as in a color, uh, with, 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 with this void, with nothing to, to, uh, to connect their life with. And as uh, our dear Imam Salahuddin mentioned, the Bilal, Bilal is a, is a real figure. He's a real human figure that had an experience that was connected with the Quran, connects with the Quran. And because and we have a parallel situation with his life and our life in America, being that he was also enslaved and then because Islam freed him and he became uh, a forerunner. He was out front. I have a, a lot of more questions here that have been, that are coming in, so I need you to try to be as concise. <laughs> as get as as can. Okay. Um, one just disappeared. Okay. What 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 is it about the African American Muslim that give them a special outlook or vision in the Islamic experience? Mm. Yes, mm. Well, I, I think that. Um, First of all, um, going back to our, well, what Imam Muhammad said, we are a new people. And, and so being a new people, Islam is really new to us. And we don't have the baggage that other Muslims might have. And so when we um, look at Islam, we're, we're kind of, I would say, um, mesmerized by it, we're we're eager to learn it. Um, we have fresh eyes. We don't have any um, interference when it pertains to that. Um, so um, it's for for us. Um, this is like a brave new world. It's like a brave new world for us uh, pertaining to Islam. And so for me, I I could talk about something personal. For me, learning, learning Islam and using, using the tools that Imam Muhammad has given us on how to interpret knowledge and how to um, extract knowledge from things has really helped, for, helped us to broaden this horizon on how to perceive Islam. Good luck. Dr. Dr. Frazier. Um, I, I, I'll be brief. Um, you know, I think that the, the community offers a beautiful expression of that you have Islam, the religion, and you also have culture. And I think that, you know, oftentimes in the broader Muslim world, sometimes um, those two can be conflated. For example, um, uh, Pashtun Wali is a moral code in which our Afghan brothers have lived by for centuries, and that is more conservative than Islam itself. Um, and you could give a number of other examples throughout the broader Muslim world where you have communities that have cultural traditions, um, including issues of FGM, um, female genital mutilation, and different very conservative practices. And so I offer that just to say that uh, this community in the United States is a product of this American experiment itself. Uh, things that have gone right, some things that have gone wrong. And I think that what this community also offers is this uh, freshness of Islam on its own terms too as well. And I think that that's probably the most interesting thing. I mean, there's a beautiful quote by the by the uh, 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 a West African Islamic thinker who said that um, I no longer need Baghdad nor Fez upon seeing Jolof I submitted. Right, Baghdad and Fez, Baghdad Iraq and Fez Morocco were considered the known Islamic 
places are one of pl two places of the Islamic world of learning. Jolof is in West Africa, and this Islamic West African thinker saw this and he said, I submitted meaning he was comfortable with seeing his own reality in an African context and particularly an African uh, Islamic framing of how he saw the world. So I would offer a very similar tradition uh, idea that I uh, highlight inside the book is that for African American Muslims, as American Muslims more broadly, being comfortable and recognizing that this in fact is homeland for us, right? That there is not a place to go back. We can do 23andMe, Ancestry.com, whatever, uh, whatever database you want to look for your ancestral roots and you'll find that. But in fact, what is emerging is an Islamic thinking that is fresh, that is rigorous, that is contemplative. What's even most interesting is that in this context right now, you have some of the best Islamic studies programs in the world, in the United States, because many of those books, classical books, the Laila uh, Qayrat, uh, the works of Imam Aqdari, whatever Islamic I th thinker you want to highlight, you can probably get those books, you can get those books in the United States and they're better preserved in the US than they are in the known Islamic world. And I'm saying this having been and studied in West Africa and the Middle East. And that says something too as well. What is the role of the broader Muslim world in terms of bringing that fresh innovation of creativity, renewal, and that renaissance, if you will, right? That offers and preserves the past because we don't want to waver from the great tradition, but offering something uh, that is, um, that is uh, forward leaning in nature. And so this right here in the U American context is that. Alhamdulillah. Okay, another, another question. And uh, also somebody, somebody mentioned that the Imam, some, when uh, Imam Salahuddin said we are new people uh, in the new Africa concept, they were thinking that Imam, when he said uh, new Africa, new people, new Africa, uh, they were saying that for a cultural representation that new African Muslims. Mm also uh, something uh, that can help our unique Islamic identity mm -hmm. uh, as a new people. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, as we move forward as a collective community, striving for excellence in our application of Islamic life in America, how best do we bring our evolving generation into an exponential leadership perspective? Mm. Ma'am Salahuddin. Yeah, so I think uh, first and foremost, we have to create systems where we begin to do succession planning, meaning that we give them the training, we give them the development, we give them the understanding um, that's needed for them to carry this torch. And I think if we do that, our community will continue to progress, but we have to, have to start doing succession planning. We have to. Yes. Dr. 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 Rahim. We have to do, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's, there's many, you know, whether you're in government, you're in technology, there's SWAT, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. There's an analysis that we have to be honest and be self-reflective. This is a beautiful time to do that in this month. You know, what is working? What's not working? Um, and how are we mitigating those efforts that aren't working? And I think that that's something that we have to constantly uh, uh, really review about what have we done and where are we going? Um, because uh, the younger generations have much more access to technology, they're doing coding, they're online, we have the advent of AI and artificial intelligence and they're, 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 they have a different space of how they see the world and they're also interacting with communities and people that um, even in, in my generation, um, we didn't necessarily have to interact with. So how are we preparing them, not just for local leadership, but global leadership? And that global leadership that they're preparing isn't just within Muslim audiences as well. I think this is very important. The skills that we prepare our children at home have to prepare them not just for Muslim audiences, but for all audiences to compete in that global collective marketplace. Um, we have clearly seen what the broader Muslim community has provided. 
um, positive and challenges to as well. And I think that we have to be prepared to be able to balance those, those efforts in a clear way. Mm -hmm. we, we've got six questions. I'm gonna try to take half of those questions so we can try to get three of them in the next uh, 10 minutes. We can close it out in the next 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, so the uh, first one, uh, these three we're gonna look at is, uh, where do you both see Islam in America? And, and get, given what you said about the Quranic leadership, I remember roughly Muhammad Hayat started out where we are right now, being ahead of the other Muslims in, this, in the beginning, having the roots that we've had in the country, and then looking at uh, what uh, Dr. Frazier was saying earlier about the other Muslim, how we become the other Muslim. So where do you both see Islam in America post COVID-19 and then in the next five years? Dr. Frazier, go first on this one, then we'll have Salam. Um, you know, I think that our community has to be prepared to, um, you know, in this current context, um, uh, constantly look at, and I, I mentioned this before about what we what we have done right and what we have what we have done wrong. We have lost many individuals in our community um, to various aspects, um, and I think that we have to be. Do we also have to recognize that in a house? You're going to have some people who are more spiritually inclined, and you're going to have some people who are more conservative. You're going to have some people who are going to be a full, a probably a combination, anything in between, but they're still under the umbrella of the Muslim tradition. And so um, I think that that's important to see that there is an evolution that is taking place. And as I mentioned, the Imam Muhammad captured it quite well, is that it's not going to look like where it was in the past. But one thing I think is very important is that we must stay on top of the times. This technology that we're doing right now, whether it's Zoom or many other platforms, is the wave of the future. And so um, this is um, showing that we have and we are prepared for the, for the future as well. But, um, but Washington, D.C. can't do this alone. It must be in small town uh, where we have our messages. We have to think about coming together where uh, we have generations that are getting older and passing on. How are we training the next generation to come into their rightful inheritance um, and having the necessary skills to lead the future as well? You want to add anything, Ibn um, Salahuddin? Yeah, so I, I um, yeah, and I think that just to add to what he just said is that um, we're going to begin to see a new uh, Islamic thought. And um, what I mean by that is that you're going to be getting to see Muslims who are more uh, thinkers. You're going to see more uh, scholars that are going to be coming from this continent and, and, and also helping to contribute to the um, Islamic world. And I also think that What's also going to happen is that you're going to see more um, institutions like um, seminaries that's going to be giving Muslim more education, making Muslims more smarter. And just like what Dr. Um, Muhammad Fraser said, is that here we have access to all the four schools of thought. So here we're able to access all the four schools of thought. So can you imagine us learning all the four schools of thought and then being able to um, extract the information that comes from them without being binded by one? Alhamdulillah, wonderful. Uh, here's one. Uh, ben benefiting from Imam W.D. Muhammad, what did we learn from him that would put us close to establishing community life? Um, you know, I think Imam Muhammad offered a, a framework, right? Uh, it's like a design plan. Um, and I think that Imam Muhammad uh, followed um, in, in offering us a community expression, opportunity for community expression in the U in American context that addresses American needs, that addresses living in, uh, in, in a Western context and to be comfortable 
in our shoes and our expression in that uh, in, in this environment as well. That I think that um, quite frankly, many people, I mean, I've been in, in many conversations with very senior imams, both in the US and elsewhere, um, who have said quite frankly to say that, um, you know, the interpret the perspective of Imam Muhammad, he was light years ahead of himself um, and ahead of us in terms of how he was pushing for uh, this community expression in the American context. And I think that what you're seeing is that that groundwork, that, that strategic thinking that he offered will now slowly be implemented by his students, the generations to come. And they, and you will see us in all aspects of life, whether it is business, it's investments, whether it is um, architectural design, whether it is fashion. And to me that, that builds off of the rich legacy from the time of Islam's origin to the present. And that is one of staying true to the essence, to the core, um, but also offering some creativity and renewal that, I, that shows um, that Islam is, is a living, um, that it is, an, uh, it, is a, it is a spirit, um, it is a religion, yeah. if you will, um, a religion, I should say, that, um, that offers these, uh, these frameworks for success. <laughs> Yeah, you, you want to add? Okay. Oh, no, yeah. This, this, this question says, um, uh, why, do, why do you think Imam Muhammad in 1975, why didn't he take his time uh, to bring the whole, to keep everybody, the whole nation of Islam together and bring them all and try to keep them all in the Al-Islam gradually? This is, this is the question. Mm. So, <laughs> go ahead. So, 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 the, so the questioner, is asking, why didn't he bring everybody into Islam proper all at one time? Yes, he, gradually, okay. gra gradually, yeah, gradually, yeah. Oh, gradually. Yeah. Mm. Well, I thought, well, he, his, in, in my opinion, his technique was to do that. He, he did do it um, at a slower pace. And then, and, and because of that, he had some people who, who, who decided to leave. You know, we had some, some big imams who were part of our community during the transition who left our community because they felt like we were moving too slow. And then we also had persons who left because they felt like that he was going against his father's wishes. So Imam Muhammad, he did, he did his best to do it at a gradual pace. And, and I think that um, just the mere fact that the, um, the amount of people who came with him during that transition was a modern day miracle. It was a modern day miracle. Yeah, he had, and he had several decades of leadership as he pulled us into, into, into proper Al-Islam as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, getting ready to close it out in, in so, so here's another question. How do we institutionalize the tafsir of Imam Muhammad for future generations and current scholars of Al-Islam? Um, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think it's really important. It took me a while, particularly, um, I think, for our young people who are listening to as well, there are a lot of, uh, uh, just like there are a lot of, there's prayer pressure. Uh, there's prayer pressure in the Muslim world too, in terms of con um, controlling the narrative of, uh, it is you either have to follow a particular madahib, um, whether it's Sunni or Shia traditions, and that um, you, if you do not do that, then in some way you're out of, uh, out of the, uh, the, the loop of traditional normative Islam. And I only bring that up because I hear this oftentimes, both, um, you know, from individuals who are, you know, just going to the masjid every day to individuals who are in academic environments or policy circles. And so what I think <clears throat> is the community has to, and hopefully this book offers that contribution, is laying the argument of mastering the tradition of of, of making sure that you understand the basics, right? You have to know how to walk first before you can, or you have to know how to crawl first before you can walk. So mastering, as the imam encouraged, a literacy in Islamic 
uh, knowledge, meaning making sure that our imams, not just those who are leading in prayer, but as all of us are home, the imams of the house, our women are well-trained in Islamic sciences, but also very much being able to situate our story, and particularly the tafsir of Imam Muhammad, should be seen in the same context of the great Imam Shatabi, Imam um, um, uh, Sahradawi, um, various Imams that have come historically and they are those who are present and understanding the, the context of what Imam Muhammad offers. He offers the context within a, an American, um, uh, particularly an American experience, but I think that others will study throughout the broader Islamic world. And so I just offer that, that those who are coming next, that our works, the tafsir, should be translated. The tafsir of Ibn Kathir is well known because students of Imam Ibn Kathir saw it as relevant and important. So those students of Imam Muhammad, if you take this effort seriously in the generations to come, see the tafsir of Imam Muhammad in a broader context and how can you translate this into Persian and Wolof and Arabic and Japanese and Chinese and situated also in its role in the contemporary context, not just in the historical context. And to me, I think that that offers to me creativity and renewal. Jazz music um, builds off of music from the past, right? You can't offer uh, being able to riff and offer the, uh, the works of Coltrane or Yusuf Days, who's a great young musician who does good music now, unless you mastered the tradition. And so I think our community has to master and continue to build off of that, but recognizing that the tafsir and the work that Imam Muhammad laid down is not inferior. It builds off and offers something that can contribute to the whole entire world. Alhamdulillah. Now, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Muhammad, because there's a lot of people, those who don't know, are very interested uh, in the tafsir of Imam Wartham Muhammad. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, he, uh, Muhammad just returned from, from Jordan. Yes. And uh, in fact, they're very interested. In fact, they're looking for a call from us. Go ahead and make that call, Muhammad. To, yes. To come in. They wanted to be in with us to tap, tap in. So while he's tapping, calling Jordan right now uh, from the U.S. Embassy there, the public affairs, uh, they want. They want to make. They're trying to make sure that that is the message that's taken abroad. So what? What? Imam Tal, if you allow me, the U.S. Embassy. I was in Jordan, and so they were interested about how Muslims celebrate Ramadan in America. And so this is a, just a short video um, that we're going to compose, just to highlight that this is what we're doing and contributing from an indigenous American Islamic thinker. Uh, right here, we have Imam Talib Sharif. Uh, we have Imam Chaplain Salahuddin Muhammad and myself, um, in which we are discussing this rich legacy of Islam in America and its contribution, how it situates in a broader um, um, uh, Islamic context, and the very strategies of success, and particularly um, how appropriate during the month of Ramadan. I don't know if Imam Tal, you want to make a few remarks. We'll, we'll have yeah, this. I just, just want to let them know that this is being aired across three May main uh, platforms. Uh, you've got the uh, webinar, uh, Zoom, uh, you have Facebook, and we also uh, have YouTube. These things are being aired across these major platforms right now. And uh, so we appreciate them having an interest and want to know what we're doing during Ramadan, how we're faring, uh, what we're teaching, what we're sharing. Uh, we certainly appreciate it and we extend our best regards to them as well for doing this blessed month of Ramadan. Uh, and also, we, we uh, have an interest in their safety uh, because we're dealing with a serious pandemic uh, across the world right now as well. So we say assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak to them. Thank you. Imam uh, Chaplain Salahuddin Muhammad, a few, few, few remarks. Uh, yes, I just want to say uh, Ramadan Mubarak and that um, we are happy and pleased to have you guys uh, tune in to us on um, Zoom and, and many uh, platforms that we're on. And we hope and pray that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, takes away this um, 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 coronavirus and that we, we hope and pray that Allah, he gives you guys tawfiq um, during, um, during the month of Ramadan. Thank you. Okay. And a very, we're going to go with this question right here. This is a good one to go with. Uh, we have others, but we apologize to all those that have sent questions in. 
uh, we will see if we can get the instructors to, to I, we have the names of, of those that we believe that we will try to get answers to their questions uh, as well. But this one says today, uh, many people are turning away from religion as a whole. And of course, we look at our context, we as the people were kind of written off and uh, lost, found, had, had really turned away from religion and we, 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 we begin to embrace this new message. So it's saying, what, what special message do we, do we have for young people who are looking for answers in the current environment? Well, um, there's, a, um, um, there's a hadith um, from the Prophet Muhammad, praise and peace be upon him, when he said, there will come a time when holding on, holding on to your religion will be like holding on to hot coal. And so this, 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 this hadith, it uh, refers to fitna, or it refers to trials and tribulation and times of hardship that a person goes through. And so um, we're living in a time where, the, where youth are trying to figure out these philosophical questions like, why do good things happen to bad people? And so, um, so, the, so we have to continue uh, to give them guidance and understanding and let them know that this is a part of life. That life, the context of life, is to have trials and tests and tribulations. But these trials and tests and tribulations are only there to make you a better human being and that God loves you. See, sometimes we don't always talk about God's love. We don't talk about his mercy. We talk about his wrath. But God loves you. And I, and I can remember as a young boy, when I actually do um, bad things, my mom or my father would, they would give me a, um, a um, they, they would punish me. And they would say, the only reason why I'm punishing you or giving you this difficulty is because I love you. And so we have to continue to push and promote this relationship with God. And one that is a of um, um, optimism. Alhamdulillah. Anything? Any quick words, Muhammad? I would say that you know, his, um, historically, the the spiritual people were seen as innovators. <laughs> In the modern world, the technologists are considered the innovators, right? Everything's on a shiny phone and using technology, Apple, Samsung, whatever product you decide to use. And so I think that the people, uh, uh, people of religion, people of spirituality, people who are, uh, who look to find, uh, who, who have had a time proven concept, if you will, that has endured time, um, who have balanced both between rituals and connecting with their fellow human beings, um, oftentimes coined as religious or spiritual people have to endure the times that we live in right now. And I think that offering though that creativity, um, it, it, the, the, all the great Muslims that have come before were leaders of their time and bringing innovation and the astrolabe, whatever items that we want to highlight because they were able to bring innovation for their particular time. And so for us too, we should ask ourselves not to, regurgitate historical facts uh, or fiction that come about just to make us feel good, but what are we providing in the present context? And that right there will be an inspiration for our children, not just now, but our grandchildren and great grandchildren as well. And I think if we think Islam in, a, in the conceptual wholeness in the words of the great late Imam Warfati Muhammad, seeing it as totality, seeing religion and culture and art and music uh, and, and mindfulness, right? In, in Islamic tradition, we have all these modern day terms that we are using now uh, that have a, an appropriation within Islamic tradition and not seeing it as some outside the form of Islam. If we see it in this totality, then I think that we will be able to offer not just something for the Muslim legacy, but for all of humanity, right? That, that, and that lastly, ma'am, most importantly, that all of humanity also is the Ummah. Yeah, so this is a beautiful, as we get ready to close again from both of our speakers in the closing out, uh, basically saying embrace the wholeness of life, 
uh, not just those parts that are comfortable. Uh, we have to accept the challenges. We have to accept the trials, as, as Imam uh, Salahuddin also said, that accepting those things, it brings out the good potential uh, that's in our human soul that our creator put there. And if we are to, if we are to maximize that, we have to accept and embrace uh, the challenge uh, to do just that. I want to thank everyone for listening. We're going to put a slide up that show we have some dynamic presentations coming up uh, next week. Uh, in fact, the last 10 uh, nights of Ramadan, uh, we have some dynamic speakers, and some of these speakers are very young uh, presenters. Uh, again, this was encourage us, uh, as the topic today was Ramadan and the Quranic leadership. Uh, so we are seeing, we're seeing the fruit uh, of that leadership. Uh, Imam Warthadi Muhammad, again, uh, because of his leadership, there's a whole people uh, that had an opportunity now to study, to love, to appreciate and to revere the words of Almighty God in the Quran. Uh, also, we find in that book, uh, we know almost 100% of the prophets that we find in the, in the books that came before, also in the Quran. So you have a great love and appreciation uh, for all the major religions, all the major faiths. And then we connect back uh, to the first human being, which means we have a great appreciation uh, coming from the Quran for all people. As again, we heard Imam Salahuddin mentioned that Imam Muhammad began to be the first one in America to embrace others who weren't Muslims because that was a Quranic uh, 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 life germ. Uh, we started in Medina and we seen in the Quran where we found all those other prophets there that he began to embrace because Allah never wanted the followers of one prophet to be fighting the followers of another uh, set of prophets. So we thank you all. We hope to see you again in the upcoming days, uh, starting from May the 13th to May the 22nd. I also I want to let you know that uh, this presentation will be posted uh, we uploaded to YouTube, and it should already be out there on Facebook. Uh, until then, let's break our fast uh, in a few minutes for those who need to break the fast. And we greet you all with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Ramadan Mubarak.